My name is Nico Homan. I'm a member of the Board of Directors at the Realtor Association, and I'm also a member of the Professional Development Committee. This is the Mastermind session. Uh, the goal of the Mastermind session, uh, we actually have four goals for this particular session. Uh, the first is for us as an association to come to our members. And so as we were talking a little bit before we got started, um, we have nearly 10,000 members of the association and not all of them are right near the building on Kennedy. They're all spread out throughout Tampa Bay. And so the idea was for us as the association to go to where our members are. And that's what we're doing with these mastermind series. Now it's been over a year that we've been doing them. We've hosted at different parts of the County, different topics, different classes. Um, and it's a way for us to engage as an association, our members, where our members are. Uh, the second goal of the mastermind series was to introduce introduce and show appreciation for our affiliates. So Genesis Title Company, this is their office space. They're the ones that um, graciously offered to host us. Um, every time we do a mastermind session, we usually have it, uh, we always have it at an affiliate's office. Um, so whether it's a mortgage, title, um, home insurance, home inspectors, things like that, um, that's who hosts us for our classes. And, and it's important for us as um, real estate agents um, we need a good team around us. And that team includes mortgage, title, um, insurance, all those different um, aspects of the real estate transaction. And if we don't have those good connections, um, then it doesn't help our clients at all. So it's good for our business. It's good for the association to um, you know, show support and appreciation for our affiliates. Um, so I would encourage you to do a little research on, on Genesis title. Um, and and um, I'm sure Brittany is going to pass up the information for uh, Debbie. Um, so if you're interested in talking with her a little bit more, we can do that. Um, the third goal of the mastermind series is um, obviously education. Education is one of the most important things that we can do um, as a, a realtor association um, is to provide classes and education to all of our members. Um, you might've heard Brittany or Grace um, at the association speak about some of the classes that GTAR has. Um, they have, have over 400 classes in 2018 um, offered to our members. About 98, 99% of them are free. Um, so I encourage you to utilize your membership benefits to the fullest. I mean, um, don't just pay your, your dues and not do anything with the association. Um, I encourage you to go to classes, um, go to networking events, really get involved with the association. Uh, and the fourth goal. So uh, first goal is to go to where our members are. Second was to introduce our affiliates. Um, third was to get educated. Fourth was to connect with um, the fellow members of the association. So I truly believe that I, as a single real estate agent, can't do anything all by myself. Um, if I'm a listing agent, I need buyer's agents out there. And if I'm a buyer's agent, I need listing agents out there. We really need to work together in order to be able to have a successfully closed transaction. Uh, I believe if you're at the negotiation table with someone, and if you have a relationship with that person at the opposite end of the table, um, it doesn't look so bad when I submit an offer that's $100,000 less than asking price. But if I have no idea who you are, and I submit an offer that's $100,000 less than asking price, you're probably not going to like me that much. So part of this is to really get to know our members, get to know the fellow agents that we have in the association, um, and learn from one another. And that's really what we're going to do today with the Mastermind session. Um, I am not a teacher. I'm a facilitator, and I'm a leader, and I'm a director. So I'm going to help guide this conversation in a couple different places. But the idea is for us to participate, um, to share what's working in our business, uh, what isn't working, what our pain points are, what our struggles are, what are some success stories that we've had, and what are some ideas that we can take away from this. Does that work for everybody? All right, sounds good. So to do that, we first need to know who we are. Um, so we'll have everybody go around the room, introduce themselves. As you can see, we got a good group of, of people here. We have people that just got their license and people that have been licensed for, for 15, 20 plus years. And, and that's really what I like about the real estate industry is that whether you are just got your license a month ago or whether you've been licensed for, for 20 years, you can learn something from one another. It's not just whoever has the most years of experience is the smartest. Um, just because you're brand new doesn't mean you can't participate and doesn't mean that you can't contribute something new or something unique. Um, to the real estate industry. So I highly encourage you. There's no stupid questions, no stupid comments, um, and we'll work with everything um, that we have moving forward. But with that, we'll go ahead and get started with the class. Um, so we are here today to talk about lead generation. Uh, lead generation by far is, is probably the most important thing that you can do on a day-to-day -day basis in your real estate business. Um, I can teach you everything there is to know about contracts and listing presentations and, and what to do after a closing. But if you don't have a lead to work with in the beginning, that all doesn't really matter. So the, the, the most important part about this is to get leads, um, to, to have people to work with, buyers, sellers, renters, whatever it is that we're looking for. Lead generation is the most important thing that we can do in our business. Um, so the next question becomes, 
how do I get a lead? Where are the leads? How much do I have to pay for them? You know, what type of lead is a good lead? And, and so then we can really dive into what makes you know, good lead generation practices. Um, but so when I take a look at, at lead generation, what I look at is what do we do as real estate agents to help out our clients? Um, you know, our clients are moving, essentially. If, if nobody in the United States moved, there would be no reason for a real estate agent to exist because no one would be buying a home and no one would be selling a home because no one moves. So really the idea uh, when you're doing lead generation is to think about reasons why people would move. Uh, and if you can figure out what those reasons are, then we have the whole world of potential lead generation sources. Uh, fortunately for us, the U.S. Census Bureau says why people move. Uh, it's very fortunate. If, if you ever have some free time and really like numbers, I highly encourage you to check out the U.S. Census Bureau and the Department of Labor and Statistics. Um, they're the most boring government agencies, but they're the most fascinating if you really like numbers. So the U.S. Census Bureau says that the top three reasons why people move, the first is housing, the second is family, and the third is jobs. Um, housing accounts for almost 44% of the reasons why people move. Uh, family accounts for about 30% and their jobs account for about 20%. So about 90, 95% of the reasons why people move have to do with their housing situation, have to do with their family situation, or have to do with their job situation. And so if we think of lead generation and we, we categorize the lead generation into those three big categories, housing, family, and jobs. That's how we can get to people before they move. And that's where we can start um, starting to advertise, starting to market to people based on those three big reasons. So with that, we'll go ahead and get started. So when we think of housing, um, what are some housing-related issues that would make someone move? Well, that, we'll call that more family. But yes, I, I, I kind of get what you're saying. Yep. Your lease is up. The lease is up. Absolutely. What, what's another housing uh, reason why someone would move? Relocation. Relocation, yep. And that might be for job, too, more expensive. Yep. There you go. What else? What are some other reasons? Housing. Like, they want to own a home. Bigger home. Absolutely. Yep. hundred percent. What are some other housing? Smaller, reasons? Home. Smaller home. Absolutely. Yep. Okay. So now, so we, we, we've thrown some good situations out there, housing of, of why someone would want to move because of the housing situation. So now how can we use some of those reason, reasons as lead generation tactics? So let's say rental. Is that what you said? That their lease is up. How could you how could you use that as a lead generation source for you? So that becomes a campaign. So when we're talking about the lead generation, we have to distinguish what our different campaigns are. Um, and there are literally thousands, if not millions, of different ways that we can advertise and campaign to our potential clients. So if we're thinking of a housing situation of why someone would move. Their lease is up. What are ways that we can, as real estate agents, get in touch with these people before their lease is up? Uh, before they have to make a decision about moving. And that is an excellent way to do that, to figure out who leased, when their lease is about to come up. And now, Steve, you're the first person, the first real estate agent that they think of before their lease expires. You know, that is a campaign that we can do that has to do with, with leasing. Um, another great one is to work with apartment complexes. So um, apartment complexes have a lot of people that are coming and going. Um, what I did when I was a real estate agent, um, and now I'm a broker, um, is I would host uh, tenant appreciation events at apartment complexes. So I, I had previously placed tenants in those apartment complexes, and I reached out to the leasing agent and said, hey, leasing agent, what I'd like to do is I'd like to host a little party at your clubhouse for all of your current tenants in the apartment complex. I'll provide some pizza and beer. Um, you can you know, advertise and market it to all of your current tenants as, hey, look how awesome I am as a property manager. We're hosting a, a pizza and beer appreciation night for all of our tenants. Why well, I, as a real estate agent, am there, and I'm now marketing to all of the uh, tenants there in the apartment complex. So from the landlord's perspective, they get a way to show appreciation for their tenants. From my perspective as a real estate agent, I can now work with people that are ending their lease and looking to either find a new lease or potentially buy a home. So when we have now two great campaigns just from our lease is coming up. And that's when we think of why people moving. Housing is a reason why people move. Now we have two campaigns that we can focus on. Kind of how we talked, one of the, the best things that you can do as a real estate agent is to connect and network with your fellow real estate agents. Same thing goes for leasing managers. So with those apartment complexes that I hosted events at, one, I had, I had placed tenants there before. So I happened to have the relationship there already. Um, and then I just kept in touch with the, the leasing specialist there. So for me, um, I'm not a big fan of cold calling or cold talking. I would always prefer a warm introduction. And there's no better warm introduction than saying, hey, 
landlord, I have a tenant for you. Um, so I would say start that way. It, it might be easier if you have a previously existing relationship with a property management company, with a landlord firm to try and grow, you know, to, have, to host events there too. Yep. Does that make sense? Okay. Sounds good. What are some other reasons that, that we threw out there for housing, why someone would move? I heard someone say bigger home. Who said the bigger home? Yeah, bigger home. Okay, so what is something with that? If someone wants a bigger home, how could we get in front of that person before they think about getting a bigger home? What are some avenues that we might consider? I would qualify that more in the job situation, but yeah, they're, they're, they're interrelated. And essentially what, um, what that is, uh, the Tampa Bay Business Journal has what's called the people on the move section. Um, so one, if you're not already registered for the Tampa Bay Business Journal, I highly recommend it. It's a great uh, resource to learn about what's going on in the business community here in Tampa Bay. Uh, but then you get access to what they call the people on the move section. And what that is, um, is a way for companies and individuals to promote um, themselves to the Tampa Bay public, whether they got a new job, whether they got a promotion, whether they're appointed to a board of directors or things like that. It's a way to showcase, hey, this is what I'm doing in my company and I want the business community to see that. That information is public. And if you subscribe to the Tampa Bay Business Journal, you get the, community, the, the contact information for those individuals. Um, they have a spreadsheet online that you can you know, easily pull. And so with that, you can find out their name, their address, write them and say, hey, you know, Steve, congratulations on your new job. Um, you know, I, I'm very excited for you. If you're ever thinking about buying a bigger home, you know, let me know. I can help you out with that. So, yeah, absolutely. Using a, a potential new job as a way to, to move up to, to say congratulations. You know, here's a bigger home for you. What are some other ways that we can, if someone is thinking about buying a bigger home, how can we get in that conversation before they think about that? How about architects? How about contractors? How about you know, vendors, suppliers? If someone is thinking about buying a bigger home, they might be building a bigger home or thinking about building a bigger home. Well, maybe if we start having connections with architects, if we have connections with custom home builders, with track builders, you know, a lot of times they have bigger homes for people to buy. Yes. So a great uh, vendor and a supplier like that is a, a painting contractor. So a lot of times before people put their homes on the market, they think about upgrading uh, their paints. You know, maybe they have a blue wall and a red wall and a purple wall on their home. Maybe they would just want to make it a little bit more beige and a little bit more tan to make it a little bit more presentable in pictures. Um, and they don't want to paint themselves, they're going to hire a painting contractor. They might even start talking to that painting contractor and say, yeah, we're painting our, our home because we're thinking about putting it on the market. Well, now if you have a relationship with that painting contractor, that contractor might turn around and say, hey, real estate agent, uh, the clients that I'm working for, they're painting their home because they're looking to put it on their market. Might be a good time for you to talk to them to give them a listing presentation. But you wouldn't know that unless you have that relationship with a painting contractor. So again, that's a potential source to use vendors, contractors, suppliers to get a potential lead. That mortgage companies are, again, a great way to do that, too. A lot of times, buyers will go to a bank or a mortgage company first to figure out you know, how much home they can afford. Um, if you have a relationship with a bank or with mortgage uh, reps, um, and that person that goes to that bank or that mortgage rep is unassigned to a realtor, that mortgage rep, if you have a good enough relationship with them, will refer you to that particular client. Um, so every time a mortgage rep calls me, I always pick up the phone. Um, you never know what that relationship might lead to. Same thing with title, um, same thing with home inspectors, things like that. Not only is it good for me to refer other good people to my clients, but you never know when some of my vendors and suppliers might be able to provide me some lead generation too. What about the people in this room? How can we utilize each other for lead generation? Pitch groups. Okay. Elab elaborate a little bit on that. There you go. Or even if they're not even the same geographic area. So let's say you only work in, in Brandon and I only work in Newport Ritchie and we don't work in each other's areas, you know, having a connection with other real estate agents, not only in, in different parts of Tampa Bay, but different parts of the state, different parts of the country. Now you can start creating a referral um, lead generation campaign. Um, it's something that I would highly recommend doing is understanding who works in particular niches um, geographically um, and then who works um, in different parts of the, the, the country. So I have probably one or two um, agent connections in each of the large cities across the country. So I know if any one of my clients here in Tampa ever moves to Denver or Dallas or Chicago, I have one or two agents that I would be happy to refer that person and vice versa. If someone is moving from Pittsburgh or Seattle and they're coming to Tampa Bay, if I'm in touch with those realtors there, um, they can send me those referrals for people coming to Tampa. So I would advertise to real estate agents just as much as you're starting to advertise to clients because, again, with the housing situation, real estate agents know when people move. And so getting in touch with those other real estate agents to find out when people move is an excellent source of lead generation for you. Sure, absolutely. So open houses is another great um, um, 
lead generation campaign. I have a love hate relationship with open houses um, in that uh, you'll find they usually get three types of people coming into your open house. Uh, one is your nosy neighbor. Uh, two are buyers that are already represented and three buyers that are not represented. So maybe of all the people that come through your open house, about a third you could potentially work with. Um, so just know that while an open house is great, it's a way to get a lot of people in your home. Um, you know, not everybody that comes through, you could potentially work with. Um, if you are going to host an open house, I would make it an event. Um, think of it from a event planner standpoint or a party planner standpoint. Um, you got to plan at least one or two weeks ahead of time. And you got to figure out a way to attract people to come to the open house. Um, so if you just put a sign in the yard on Friday that you have an open house on Saturday, you're not going to get as much attention if you had posted that a week before, put it on the MLS, put it on Zillow, put it on Facebook, that you're having an open house. Um, then get people to come there. So say we're raffling off a $25 Amazon gift card to everybody that walks through our open house. All you got to do is fill out our form and we'll give you a, you know, uh, an email once the open house is over um, as a way for you to attract people to come and then as a way for you to get the uh, contact information for the buyers. And not everybody that walks through an open house is willing to sign a form with their contact information. But if you say, hey, I'm going to give you a $25 Amazon gift card, yeah, they'll probably sign. Another uh, good potential source for open houses is to work with uh, custom home builders or track builders. Uh, a lot of custom home builders and track builders have spec homes or inventory homes that are just sitting. A lot of times if you approach them, um, they go to their model home and say, hey, you know, custom home builder, I see you have uh, a home that's sitting there. Um, how about I, as a real estate agent, host an open house in your spec home or in your inventory home? It's a way for you to showcase your home. You know, I'll take pictures of it, post it on social media, get a lot of attention for you as a builder. Uh, but then also, I'm looking for potential buyers too. So it's a win-win for both you as a builder and me as a real estate agent. And again, if you have those relationships with those right home builders, um, they'll let you have open houses in their spec homes. They might even let you do an open house in their model home and help work that. Yep. Yeah, one of the things I also do with an open house is that uh, I have a, a, a letter um, that I print out. And, and when I, before, either a day or two before I host an open house, I go knock on the neighbor's door and say, hey, just wanted to let you know, you know, Saturday afternoon, I'm planning on hosting an open house. Are there any cars or anything that park in your driveway or in the street or anything like that? Let me know. Give me a call. Here's my contact information. Um, it's a way to show appreciation for your neighbors, um, to say, I'm looking out for you, um, but I'm not here to sell you anything. Oh, by the way, I happen to be a real estate agent and we're having an open house tomorrow. So it's a way to you know, let the other people know that, yeah, we're having an open house. So those I would qualify as track builders. So the builders like that, they're building, you know, communities with 20, 50, uh, 100 plus homes in it. Um, and yes, they have sales reps that work in the model homes uh, for Ryan and DR. But what Ryan and DR and, and Lenar and KB and David Weekly and what all those builders do, is a lot of times they build homes before having a buyer ready to go to buy that particular mm -hmm. home. And so let's say, you know, a, 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 a DR Horton Coral model in Union Park up in Wesley Chapel, um, they have a, a move-in ready home, essentially, um, but they don't have a buyer ready to go. You could approach the DR Horton rep at the sales office and say, hey, I see you have, you know, this Coral model available. Um, it's already built. No one's, you don't have a buyer for it. Let me host an open house for you in that particular model to help you sell that particular home. So almost as if that uh, coral model was your own listing. One other thing that, that I like to do, and I haven't heard other people do this, is I actually use my own listing presentations um, as a way to generate leads. Um, and the way I do that is in every single listing presentation that I have, uh, one of my last pages is that I actually refer two or three other real estate agents to the buyer or to the seller that I'm, I'm working with. Um, and the reason I do that is a couple of different reasons. One, um, it's to show that I not only did homework on their home, on their, their neighborhood, on their price points, but I also did homework on the other people that could potentially list this home. And then it shows to the seller that, you know, I've done my homework. I know what I'm talking about. Um, but two, it also heads off the fact that that seller is probably going to have a conversation with those two or three other listing agents. You know, I'm not randomly picking ones. I'm, I'm picking people that could potentially work well with that seller. And then it also shows confidence that if I go to a seller and say, hey, you know, Mr. Mr. Seller, here's my listing presentation. Oh, by the way, here are two or three other listing agents that could do the exact same thing that I'm doing. Um, they're thinking, wow, Nico must really know what he's talking about if he's willing to give the competition's information away. Um, with that, before I even go to the listing presentation, I talk to those two or three other listing agents and say, hey, I'm about to give a listing presentation. I would like to refer you to these clients, if I don't get the listing, are you comfortable with that? 
And I've yet to have an agent say, no, I'm not comfortable with having a, a listing presentation. Um, so I have done listing presentations where I have not got the listing, but I've never done a listing presentation without making money off of it. And if I don't get the listing, then I charge a referral fee for that new listing agent that did get the listing. So when you're doing a listing presentation, figure out there's ways that even if you don't get the listing, there are still ways that you could potentially make some income off of that listing presentation. So that was reason number one, um, as far as um, their housing situation on why people would move. Um, second most common reason why people move is because of their family situation. So what are some issues that we think of when someone um, has a family reason? Why would someone... Divorce. There you go. I'm just, <laughs> just really excited about divorce. Yeah. <laughs> so how so how would we get in front of someone like that before divorce attorneys? Divorce attorneys absolutely. So a, a, a great connection that that I would like to that I make is with uh, divorce attorneys because with the divorce, a lot of times the couple owns property. Um, and with that, they have to figure out what to do with the property once they divorce. Does it stay in, in one person's name? Does the other spouse have to buy another property? Do they sell that asset and distribute the funds between the two divorcing spouses? Um, either way, there's probably some sort of real estate transaction involved in a divorce. And the first person that the divorcing couple is going to talk to is probably a divorce attorney. And if that divorce attorney has connections with real estate agents, they're probably going to refer that real estate agent to that divorcing couple. So that would be an excellent source to use divorce as a potential lead generation source, getting in front of attorneys that are working with divorcing clients. Death, absolutely. So how could we how could we utilize that as a lead generation source? Go to estate sales. Go to estate sales, sure. Absolutely. More choice. More choice. Okay. So how would we work with that? It, yes. So, so obviously uh, the way that you approach um, that sort of lead generation would be a very different approach if you're approaching uh, a custom home builder, if you're approaching an architect. There was an article a couple years ago in NAR magazine how there was a real estate agent, I forget where she was, but she hosted networking events at funeral homes. Um, and that was her shtick. She would host the networking events and appreciation events for her clients at funeral homes. And the funeral home would help market and coordinate that. But it was, again, it was a way to you know, use death as a potential lead generation source. Yeah. What's some more happier reasons, family <laughs> reasons we could use for lead generations besides divorce and death? Just had a child. So that's a very good one. So, so how could we, how could we potentially use, um, you know, children? How, how does, where might we enter that conversation before anybody else would? Pediatricians. Pediatricians, that's not a bad one. What else? Daycare, birth announcements, absolutely. Yep. So getting in touch with, with families with young children um, or with one young child, they probably might have another child or more children. Um, and, and knowing that, hey, you have two kids, you're about to be pregnant with your third, you might need to move from your two-bedroom apartment. I'm a real estate agent. I can help you out with that. So trying to figure out how we can use that as a potential lead generation source absolutely work. How about getting married? Getting married is a big, you know, it's, it's the opposite of divorce, actually. Um, so maybe get in touch with uh, wedding planners. You know, a lot of times when, when couples get engaged, uh, one of the first people that they reach out to is a wedding planner or an event planner or a wedding photographer or a wedding DJ or something like that. Getting in touch with people that travel in the wedding circle, um, then you'll understand who are those people that just got engaged and then who are getting married. Uh, Census Bureau says that 40% um, of couples um, that get married will buy a home in the next two years. Um, so there's a high percentage of people that get married and that, that buy homes. Um, another way to work with that is um, Hillsborough County um, on their public records uh, website. You can search any sort of public document. A marriage license is a public document. So if we wanted to go to the Hillsborough County website, um, research who got married yesterday based on wedding licenses, uh, we can pull who got married yesterday. Um, what their names are, what their addresses are. And then I, as a real estate agent, can send them a congratulations card. I'm getting married because I pulled their information from public records. Um, so again, using wedding as a potential lead generation source um, is now ways that we can get in front of clients uh, before they move using weddings. We could take that a step further and maybe even go with uh, financial advisors, financial planners. A lot of times they'll have an understanding of, of people's finances, whether they're bad, you know, maybe they're struggling with their finances, or maybe on the opposite end, they're, they're good. Maybe they, they came into a lot of cash and they figure out, need to figure out how to invest that, that money wisely. Yeah, so figuring out people's financial situations and, and who's in charge of people's financial situations. Maybe it's a tax accountant, maybe it's a financial advisor. Creating relationships with those type of people um, is, is absolutely a way that we could potentially get in front of, of lead sources. How about schools or churches? 
Anybody try marketing and advertising to schools or churches or parent teacher uh, groups, things like that. On that, that same front, how about uh, admissions directors? You know, private schools, private high schools, colleges, things like that. They'd all have admissions directors. And a lot of times, uh, new students, uh, whether relocating to, to Tampa Bay, um, the first thing they're going to talk to is in a potential admissions director at that school. And so a lot of times, admissions directors know, um, you know, who's moving down from Michigan, or who's moving from Atlanta, and, and they're looking for a new school um, and interviewing different schools before they find a home. Well, if you're getting in touch with those admission directors um, at those different schools, um, and you can say, hey, admissions director, you focus on the student and everything with the school. I, as a real estate agent, will focus on the neighborhood and everything having to do with the housing. So using schools, admissions directors, it's definitely a good source of leads for you. First time homebuyer presentations. Yep, absolutely. So one of the things that, that I really uh, preach is, is working with your, your sphere of influence, your circle of influence, um, your close family and friends network, especially when you're first getting started. Multi-generational. Multi-generational, sure. Absolutely. So how might you use that as a lead generation activity? So something like that too. So one of the things that you could do with that is create a campaign specifically for multi-generational family, whether that's Facebook, Google ads, you're writing blog posts, videos, you know, you specifically go out there and find the existing properties, the new construction properties that fit multi-generational family. And now for the next month, your online content is about sharing multi-generational family homes um, with the idea to get more potential buyers for that or as someone that has a multi-generational family home that's looking to list it. Now you become that expert in that, in that little niche. Um, and that's how you grow it that way. Um, and the same thing with any little niche, whether it's a fixture up or whether it's foreclosures, whether it's new construction, you know, figure out how you can, you know, uh, become that expert in that little niche and then grow it that way. How about um, nursing homes and things like that? How I, we use nursing homes as a potential lead generation source for us. Sure. So if someone is, if, if someone is, is moving their, their, their parents into a nursing home, um, maybe they have to sell their existing home that grandma and grandpa's in before they move into a nursing home. Um, maybe that nursing home had that conversation with those clients uh, to understand, hey, they're moving into this nursing home. They need to sell their existing home in the process. Oh, by the way, we happen to know these real estate agents that can help you out with that process. So getting in touch with nursing homes, um, with things like that, um, retirement community. All right, sounds good. So the last reason, the, the, the big three, housing, family, and jobs. Jobs is the number three reason why people move. What are some things that might have to do with someone's job, why they would move? Promotion, retirement. So I've heard a couple. So military, relocate. When someone has to move, relocating from a different city, um, a lot of times we want to talk to the people that have something to do with those jobs. So whether they're the HR managers, whether it's a recruiter, a staffer, a headhunter, uh, those people know when people have to move because of a job-related issue. Um, and if we have connections with those HR managers, those staffers, recruiters, headhunters, um, we can say, hey, you, know, you guys focus on uh, everything that has to do with the job. And I, as a real estate agent, will help um, that family with everything having to do with the home. Um, kind of like the um, admissions directors at schools, HR managers are essentially the admissions directors for, for companies. Um, you know, some companies are huge, like AT&T, and they'll have a whole you know, division within the HR to set up relocation. Other companies are small. They might only have 10, 20 people, and they might not have all of those resources, in which case you then would be a perfect fit as a real estate agent. Say, look, I, you don't have the resources to help with relocation and moving and things like that. Why don't I do that as a real estate agent? I help you know, this person, your, your new hire from Washington, D.C., come down to Tampa um, I'll help them find the, the right school district, the right home. You just get them set up with a job, and I'll help them work on the home Another side. What else? What are some other job-related? Um, they lose their job. They lose their job. Sure, absolutely. That might, they can't you know, afford the house anymore. They can't afford the home anymore, absolutely. So, it's again, it's, it's not a fun way, kind of like death and divorce, um, but if there is a potential transaction to work there, too. Um, and that could be something, too, that you could offer, you know, look, I understand you're losing your job. You're not able to make payments. You know, maybe there are some ways that you could essentially work, um, you know, two transactions. One, let's say, look, I'll help you downsize. You know, maybe I'll, I'll help you with, you know, uh, you know my fees on, on the listing side, but then, you know, I collect them on the buying side. So there's different ways that you can approach someone losing their job as a potential way to say, I can work with you on this one. And, but again, being in touch with those HR managers, staffers, recruiters, those are people that are going to know if it's a large company and they have to make layoffs, that is public record. They have to file that information with the state of Florida. And so you could find when a company, if AT&T has to lay off 1,500 people in the state of Florida, they have to publish that. Um, and so you can get in front of that before anybody else knows that too. How about starting a new business? 
Yeah. Maybe you're not joining a new company, but maybe you're moving to a different you know, city, different town to start your own business. Um, if you have to start your own business, you have to file the incorporation and all the paperwork and things like that. Tampa Bay Business Journal and other publications um, post that information publicly. Um, once a week, there's probably, I don't know, close to 100 different new businesses that start in, in Tampa Bay. So you could. Sunbiz, Sunbiz, absolutely. That's another good one, too. You can figure out who's starting a new company, uh, reach out to them and say, hey, I see you're starting a new company in Tampa. Um, if you're relocating, I can help you out with that. If you need to hire some new staff that's relocating, I can help you out as a real estate agent, too. So understanding where those people are when they move. How you can get in front of them before they do is your, your lead generation activity there. How about the Economic Development Corporations, the EDCs? Now, those are similar to um, recruiters and staffers. They're the ones that bring AT&T's headquarters to Tampa Bay. Uh, they're the ones that show off to large corporations. You know, everything that's going on in Channel Side with Water Street and Jeff Phoenix Project, um, they're bringing in large corporations to relocate. Um, the EDC is part of that, too. And, and you can be a part of the Hillsborough Tampa EDC Economic Development Corporation um, and get in front of those organizations. Say, hey, you organizations, you're promoting Tampa Bay to organizations. Um, how about I help promote Tampa Bay from a housing perspective to all the people that are working in those organizations? All right, sounds good. So we covered the big three. So family, housing, and jobs are the big three reasons why people move. And those provide us with a ton of lead generation activities um, within those three categories. Um, they list other, you know, five, 10% of, of other reasons why people move or other lead generation activities. Um, so what are some things that we haven't talked about um, that have worked in the past for you? Or what are some things that we haven't talked about that didn't work for you? What are some things you like to do? What are some things you don't like to do for lead generation? Yeah. Yep. So with that, it's, it's kind of one of the things that, that I uh, uh, talked about at the beginning is, is a cold calling or is it warm calling essentially? And then door knocking a lot of times is, is completely cold. Um, you know, unless you're doing your homework and specifically targeting specific homes in specific neighborhoods um, on who to knock on, you know, if you're just knocking on every single door, it's, it's all cold. But if you target, you know, one particular neighborhood and you can research, okay, we know the average person moves every eight years, you can see in that neighborhood who bought their home six years ago. Um, and then maybe instead of knocking on every hundred doors in the neighborhood, maybe just knock on the eight uh, homes that bought six years ago. And now your door knocking becomes a little bit more effective that way too. Mm -hmm. And then you could target it. So if we look up the, the homes that sold six years ago, um, then we can create the content that would be appealing to someone like that. You know, there's nothing that says you can't do a CMA for someone you don't have a listing presentation for. Uh, one of the things that I first did when I practiced um, was to do a listing present or a CMA for every single home in my neighborhood, um, and then I would pass that out. Um, same thing there. You know, I would do a sample CMA for someone. Say, hey, saw you bought your home six years ago. You know, over the last six years, your home has appreciated this much uh, in value. Um, if you're interested in selling your home, you know, let me know. That becomes a much more uh, warm knock than a cold knock. So cold knock because you don't know that person directly. So I, I also then look at, okay, if there are a million different ways to generate leads in real estate, what are the most effective things that I can do with my time? And what are the most effective things that I can do with my dollar? Um, if there's a neighborhood of 100 homes and only six of them um, have homes that could realistically sell, um, I'm going to have to spend time research, researching those six homes. I'm going to have to walk to those six homes, knock on the door. It might take me an hour to go 30 minutes to an hour to knock on those six doors and have that conversation. You know, is that an effective use of my time? And is that an effective use of my money? You know, and then there's a time that I had to research that, time that I have to drive to that. So when I look at all the different ways that I could potentially generate leads, I put that on the low scale priority in that it takes a lot of time. Uh, the conversion rate isn't so great. Um, and I'm going to get a lot more negative feedback than I would positive feedback too. So yes. I, so one of the things that I don't discourage any type of lead generation activity, I would just say, how does this fit in your, you know, your business practice of, is it effective use of your time and your money? So with that, with uh, a FISBO, someone is selling their home for sale by owner. So a couple of things with that. One, the market is getting better and overall fewer people are selling their, ho their homes by themselves. Um, so they are seeing that the price point is going up. Um, they see that there is uh, value in using a real estate agent to sell their home. So overall, the general FISBO market is going down. It's, it's less than 10% in Tampa Bay of homes sold that actually sell by FISBO. Um, 
with the 10% roughly that do sell the homes by themselves, their most important factor is you know, money. At the end of the day, that's what they're looking for more so than a typical seller. Um, and that's the reason why they choose to do it themselves because they feel like they can save money on it. And so with that, if I know someone's motivation for why they're selling their home, now I can have a better conversation with them uh, when I try to sell the home for them. So if I know their ultimate motivation is money, I better make sure that I have the right comps, that the um, Zillow's estimate, the Realtor.com estimate, all those things are, are close in line to what they're trying to sell it for. And I better you know, have the best net sheet in the world that says, okay, if you're looking to make $50,000, um, know, here's how we can make $50,000 with listing it at the price point that you want with all the fees that are associated with it. And if you can make that case to a FISBO that they're going to make the money that they want to hit while using you as a real estate agent, there's no argument that they can come back with that says, no, they're not going to do that. It's when the money doesn't work out. That's when it becomes a much difficult, much more difficult conversation for you as a real estate agent to say, here's why your price point is, is you know, way too high. What about Another approach that you could potentially have with, with a FISBO is, you know, they're selling their home they're going to have to buy a home somewhere. So why not, instead of approaching them to say, hey, I'd like to list your home, why not approach them and say, hey, I see you're looking to sell your home. You know, what's your next step for you? you know, are you moving somewhere else in Tampa Bay? Or are you moving to you know, Charlotte, North Carolina? Hey, I happen to know a real estate agent in Charlotte. You know, if you're interested, I'd be happy to make that introduction for you. So start with ways that you can provide value to someone versus you know, starting with ways to say, hey, I want you to pay me for, for my services. Um, so approach it from, what are you doing next? How can I help with you after you sell your home, you know, whether you sell it through whether you sell it through me, how can I help you next? And now that becomes a much easier conversation to, to have with that person because they're not, you know, they're not, they're not, their first instinct isn't to say no to something like that. But to to kind of go a little bit on that and some of the questions that, that you had. So uh, uh, most of the reasons why a home doesn't sell um, has to do with pricing, um, has to do with the actual terms that the seller is looking for in a particular contract. And then the third would be the marketing activities that the agent did or didn't do. So essentially, if you and your conversation with either a FISBO or with an expired or really with any potential seller would be, you know, here's what I think the right market price is. Uh, here's what I think the terms should be of your contract. And here are some things that I'm doing as a real estate agent to help market and advertise your home. And so if you can overcome those three big objections, when you're talking with someone about a, a listing, you know, chances are, and if your plan is right and they like it, they're going to use you. When you first got your license, that becomes public record. And so you got a lot of postcards from brokerages and things like that trying to recruit you. Um, the reason that you looked at that is because it's effective. You are actually in the market, you know, potentially for something like that. I would say one of the, the issues with mailing 2,000 pieces to everybody is that not everybody's in the market right now. So at that point, it becomes as much of a branding activity as it is a, a lead generation activity. If you kind of go back to the door knocking scenario where instead of mailing a postcard to all 100 homes in the neighborhood, mail a, a postcard to the six homes that the sellers have been in there for the last six years and tailor your postcard to say, hey, you've been in your home six years. Here's how much prices have appreciated in this neighborhood over the last six years. And now people have something that's a little bit more recognizable, um, that speaks to them a little bit more versus a postcard that says, dear homeowner, I'm a real estate agent. You know, it, but I will say that is part of a greater campaign. So if, if, you're, if the only thing that you're doing to advertise yourself is a postcard mailing campaign, it's not going to work. But if you're doing a postcard mailing campaign, if you're hosting an appreciation event in that neighborhood, if you have you know, Facebook ads targeting that people, you know, if you have radio and TV commercials now, now it becomes a greater campaign um, that's really going to affect it. But if it's just that one standing alone, it's not as effective. So mm -hmm. it has to be part of a greater campaign and how you can tie it into other branding activities as well. Yep. Yep. So when I always you know, teach about advertising marketing, is put yourself in the shoes of the receiver of the message. You know, how does this message look to them and, and look to you? you know, when you see a piece of advertising out there, what speaks to you? What is effective to you? And that's usually something that's you know, much more tailored to what you're looking for. And so with all these different messages, the more tailored you can get it to the specific lead that you're looking for, you know, the better. That's what I would say with that. All right. So with that, it's right at 1130. Um, if you have to go, you're more than welcome to go. Make sure you sign out before you go. Uh, grab some of the flyers. Um, if you'd like, stick around and, and network with your fellow agents. But again, we appreciate you coming by. Thank you very much. Thank you.